Good morning. My name is Courtney, and I'll be reading scripture this week. Today's teaching text comes from Luke 14, 25 through 33, which can be found on page 874 in the Bibles under your chair. Please stand in reverence for the reading of God's word. Now a great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the costs, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat. Hey, elephant, elephant in the room, it's a lot of Nick Vulcaning today. For some, for some of you, you're like, finally. And then there are others of you who are going, okay, church is a sanctification act. God is changing me right now. Either way, you're welcome, right, <laughs> I suppose. Um, this, uh, this passage, you'll notice we're taking a one-week break from the book of Romans right now, um, primarily because this is the last week that we have with some of you. Like some of you are about to graduate and you're about to be launched out into the world. Um, and we believe it's our responsibility um, as a pastoral team um, to commission you to that work. And so we wanted to take a week to very specifically do that. Now, um, if you're not graduating, um, this text still applies to your discipleship and walk with Jesus. So I don't want you to turn the volume down um, if you're not a graduate today. Um, Because let's be honest, if you just listen to the text that was read this morning, it's a bit of a tough one, isn't it? This is not marshmallow sandwich Jesus. This is high octane Jesus. It's a difficult one. And as you are about to graduate and launch your way into the world, this is the kind of proposition that Jesus stands and offers to you. He asks you some really difficult questions. He puts some very difficult propositions forward to you. And the decisions that you make in regards to who is going to get the ultimate allegiance of your life is going to shape the trajectory. I'm not just for eternity, but for the next years of your professional life. And so the main point of this text and the main point of today's sermon that we want to commission you out with is that the invitation to Jesus calls for ultimate allegiance. Make no mistake, it is an invitation. What does he say? Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? More hard work? No. More rest. I'll give you rest. There's an invitation into the heart of Christ for you that is very real and very true. But Jesus is not asking you in that invitation to say, why don't you add me to the other gods of your life? Or why don't you sprinkle some Jesus on top of your agenda for your life, and then we'll call it good. No, no, no. He is saying, I am Lord. I am either Lord or nothing in your life. And so, man, these words are very significant for us at a watershed moment, but man, they are significant for really every moment of discipleship if you think about it. Jesus offers an invitation this morning. It's important that you know we as followers of Jesus are a people of invitation. Like from top to bottom, we are a people of invitation because God has invited us. He stepped down below the line into the story of human history and He welcomed us by his life, death, and resurrection, said, come to me. And therefore, because we have been welcomed by God, guess what? Now we are welcoming others to God. 
we are sort of relaying the message of the invitation from on high. So I want to go ahead and just put my cards on the table this morning. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus in the room or you're listening in online, we want you to become a Christian. That is, um, you're like, these people always have an agenda. Listen, everybody always has an agenda. That's, that's how the world works. The truth is, who is the best king? Who is the person or the being or the system or the plan to which to give your life to, which actually leads to human flourishing and eternal wholeness? We believe Jesus is that king. And so, yes, we want you to bow your knee to the king. But But here's what happens so often in making that invitation. With the best of intentions, here's what Christians do. We talk, we we think like this, how do I make the gospel as attractive as possible so more people will believe it? Now listen, the gospel is attractive, but it's also really offensive. When we start thinking like that, how do I make it as attractive as possible? We sort of join Jesus' PR team. And we go, okay, how do I sort of undersell or soft sell here? And when you do that, you undersell the cost. We're actually undermining the invitation. See that? With the best of intentions, we undermine the invitation by underselling the cost. That's, and that's with the best of intentions. You know what happens with the worst of intentions? This is how people start cults. You know that, right? I mean, think about it yeah, come on, come on, join up, let's get in. And then you get in, and what happens? Then you get all the fine print. Then you get all the cost. Then you get all the difficulty. Then you get all the trials and the sorrow that come with it. I would argue that underselling the cost of following Jesus is one of many complex reasons that deconstruction is sweeping the Christian world. Because people have been sold a gospel that costs them nothing, And therefore, when suffering comes and life gets difficult, it becomes too great a cost to bear, and you bail. Your Lord, oh, He's so kind, He bolds the fine print on the front end. He doesn't undersell the invitation. In fact, He almost oversells the invitation. He makes the choice more difficult. He essentially says to these people and to us, give up everything that you care about. I mean, we'd look at somebody who lives like that, who gives up everything for Jesus, and we go, man, what a, what a stud. Like, what a mature Christian. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's not Christian stud. That's like, that's the entry point. You see, in our flesh, giving up everything is really hard. And some of you are probably having that wrestle right now going, man, what's going to be the ultimate goal or the ultimate allegiance of my life? In our flesh, it's really hard to give everything up. But if you belong to Jesus, I got some really good news for you. There's resurrection power inside of you. You have a new nature. The Bible says you are a new creation. The old nature has passed away. So that old part of you that clings on to you, that wants to resist a passage like this and say ultimate allegiance, ugh, that part of you, man, we just get to throw those old grave clothes off today because they're not going to serve us anymore. You see, Jesus even goes further in Matthew's gospel to say whoever finds their life Whoever pursues their own life and their own pleasure at all costs will lose it. But whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Jesus is inviting you to life here. He's not trying to put more burdens on you. He's trying to free burdens from you. So this morning, in light of Jesus' words that we're going to study, we can have the courage to ask some really, really difficult questions. And I think they're really important ones for you to ask, especially if you're about to transition seasons. Okay, so here's the three questions. I want you to keep these in your mind as we study. Number one, have I really given up everything to my king? Have I really said mainly yes to him and sort of yes to everything else? You got to ask. You got to ask that this morning. Question number two, am I being honest about the cost of following Jesus when I invite others to him? Am I saying, make no mistake, he will not share lordship of your life. If he is king, he is king. 
And then the last question. This one might feel like the most vulnerable and hard one to ask, but I really want you to ask it sincerely today. Is he worth it? I want you to judge the answer to that question looking at today's text. Like, is the, he's asking for everything. Is he worth it? I want you to ask. So, a couple of things as we're sort of breaking this whole thing apart. The first thing I want to look at is the cost of the invitation. Let's look at the cost together. In verse 25, he says, Now great crowds accompanied him. Let's actually stop there for just a second. By all external measures, Jesus' public ministry at this point is going amazingly. Did you notice that? Great crowds accompanied him. Like in the West, we tend to think of a crowd as like a measure of success, right? If you can get a crowd of money, if you can get a crowd of people, um, if you can get any kind of crowd, it is your job as a good leader or a good professional to keep and grow that crowd and influence, right? And Jesus' disciples are going to be feeling that same pull too, right? They're seeing this guy that they love grow in influence, and they love it. They want more people to come to Jesus' influence. But Jesus is doing something quite interesting right here in that he is moving from, um, from recruiting season in ministry to training season. So think about it like this. In recruiting season, you are calling people in to get them on the team, and then what happens in training season? We get to work. We grow in some toughness and some grit. And so as he's making that transition right here, as the great crowds are gathering around him and his followers are going, man, this is fantastic, we love it, instead of viewing that crowd as success, or as good, or the thing that he has to hold on to at all costs, doesn't he sort of seem to do the opposite? Great crowds accompanied him, and look what he says to them in verse 26. He turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple." Now, if that had been the call to worship this morning, how would everybody have felt about that, right? A little like, is Nick okay? Like, is he mad about it? You feel the intensity of a statement like that? You hear how shocking words like that are? Hate them? The people in the world I most care about, Jesus, you're asking me to hate them? See, some of you just heard that, and you felt relief because you went, oh, I already hate my family. Perfect. <laughs> not like that, okay? You stop it. We're going to talk about this later. That's not what he means. I mean, this is the least crowd-pleasing sermon of all time, isn't it? Imagine what's going on in the hearts of the disciples. They hear Jesus say words like this to the influence in the crowds, and they're going, who's going to run PR right here? Like, I mean, Peter, is it you? Thaddeus, are you going to, somebody's got to say something like, okay, everyone, that's going to wrap up today's press conference. We'll be back with some miracles first thing tomorrow morning. Like, I mean, just when things seem to start taking off, Jesus turns around and says something seemingly absurd. Here's what we got to ask as Bible readers. Why does he do it? What's he getting at? Well, number one, he is at least shocking them. Remember from English class, you probably learned the word hyperbole, right? Where you use extreme language to evoke uh, a response, right? Shock sort of grabs the attention of your audience. And make no mistake, Jesus is shocking his audience with these words. He's also demanding ultimate allegiance. I mean, in the ancient world, even more so than now, there was a loyalty to family really above all else. I mean, we are, we are a people of covenant, but um, that all works a little bit differently under the new covenant. And so, for, for these ancient Jews, what I'm trying to boil down and say is that family was a big, big deal to these people. And so, for Jesus to say, 
hate them? Man, he's demanding something that would have felt so jarring. Now, you need to know there, is a, there are a couple of senses in which the Bible uses the word hate. One, the sense that you and I would think of naturally, hate to despise or abhor something, right? I hate that thing. I hate that person. It's this despising comment. But there's also this other sense which ancient Jews would use the word hate as a, um, a phrase of comparison. So it was like relative preference was basically the idea. So think of in the Old Testament, if you've ever read, um, Jacob I loved, but Esau I, anybody know? Hated. Right. What, what was uh, he saying about his sons right there? I have a preference for this particular son, for Jacob. And we know that Jesus, while he's still, I don't want to take the offense or the shock out of what he's saying, but we know that he's using it in that second sense because he's already told us in Luke chapter 10 before this that we are to love our neighbors. Jesus is very pro-family in the way that he talks. He, he is not saying that we should literally despise or abhor our families, but he is saying that in comparative allegiance, your love for them should look like hatred compared to your allegiance to and love for Jesus as king. I mean, think of the person in your life that you love the most. And I want you to think for a moment about how you express that love to them. Let's pretend that expression of love should look like hatred in comparison to the way that you love, adore, serve, and show your allegiance to Jesus. I mean, that's an audacious claim, is it not? Jesus is shocking them. He is demanding ultimate allegiance, and He's also sorting the crowd. Make no mistake, there are people following Jesus at this time because he is doing cool stuff. I mean, imagine for a moment, if you heard this week that in downtown Champaign, somebody has been walking around and healing people who had been blind from birth or raising people from death, would you not go get a look? Now, we have the luxury of like, we're probably looking for an Instagram reel or a TikTok video of this happening, but but wouldn't there be something inside of you that goes, I have to go lay my eyes on this and see what's happening? There's an amusement to it. There's an amazement about it. Now, the, there, there are people there who love that he's doing cool stuff. They don't believe that he's the Lord, the Messiah, the King, the one that they would give their allegiance to, but they like the show. To quote a guy named Kyle Eidelman, those are what we would call fans, not followers. And Jesus is sorting the fans and the followers. A fan can't handle a statement like that, can they? I mean, the miracles are cool, but you just told me to hate everything that I care about the most. That's probably it for me if I'm a fan. But what do the followers say? There's another episode in John's Gospel where Jesus says something another absurd statement like this. And a lot of the crowd leaves and he turns to his disciples and he says, are you going to leave too? You remember Peter's response? Where else would we go, Lord? You have the words of life. You see the difference between a fan or a follower? You got to ask the question as you're headed into the next season of your life, am I a fan or am I a follower? Have I really seen Jesus for who he is? Or do I just like what he can do for me? I will tell you this morning, if you are looking for the easiest life, if you are looking for the least controversial life, words like these from Jesus will cause you to walk away. But if you realize and find that life is actually found in Him, words like these pull you to His cause closer than ever before. I got to ask you this morning, how does that sit? Like some of you might feel that and you've, you're starting to squirm because you're not thinking about family or friend as a concept. You're thinking about names. You're thinking about people that you really love. 
Jesus isn't saying you shouldn't love those people. But he's saying if push came to shove, if it really cost you that relationship, is Jesus precious enough to your heart that you would follow him? Some of you might hear these words from Jesus and you feel a little cheated. You're like, man, I was told I just need to pray a prayer and that was it. Now listen, I don't want you to confuse concepts right here. Grace is a free gift of God. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to get it on your own. It's just something that you open your hands and receive. But listen, do you know what people who have actually received unimaginable grace do? They live in utter devotion to the giver of that grace. I mean, imagine for a moment that somebody came in, you were on death row, and they said, hey, your, uh, your sentence has been canceled. You're free to go. And you saw somebody else getting the orange jumpsuit on and being put into your cell. He said, what, what happened here? And they said, well, that person just traded places with you. And you walked out of the prison free. Would you not live differently in light of that grace? Wouldn't it change the way that you lived? You see, the Lord is actually being quite kind to you and me this morning by helping us discern whether we are a fan or a follower. Because if you think you're a follower, but you're actually a fan, it is the mercy of God for Him to alert you and call you to repentance today. Where does your ultimate allegiance lie, my friend? There are a lot of good things in the world. Make no mistake, family's a good thing, career's a good thing, marriage, parents, children, friendship, you, all of, all of those things are good things, but they were never meant to be ultimate things. Where is your allegiance? Jesus is saying to us this morning, if you don't love me more than all of these things, you're not going to make it to the end with me because it's going to cost too much. It's going to be too difficult. It goes straight against our instincts, doesn't it, to give up our own priorities and everything that we love. What's natural to our humanity is self-preservation. But as a disciple... Your allegiance moves from self to Savior. There's a shift. There's a tangible shift. In fact, I would argue that you cannot rightly love or honor the relationships and the things and the people that God has given you in your life unless He's ultimate. Because guess what happens when you make your family ultimate? When they disappoint you, you're shattered beyond belief. What happens when you make your career ultimate? When, when the job who is your salvation fires you and says, I don't want you anymore, you are erased of dignity and value. But when Jesus is the king, when he's the ultimate allegiance, now you may be sad when you get fired from your job, but you're not crushed by it. When things aren't right in your family, you're still okay in Jesus. See, the question I've been asking myself in studying this text is, why does Jesus require such devotion on the front end? I mean, if you think about it, just from a pragmatic perspective, like every other commitment in the world allows you to, to ease in. Nothing asks you for zero to 100 in that way. Like imagine if you went to CrossFit in town and you were like, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about trying CrossFit. And they said, you need to sign a contract in blood for 100 years. And if you miss, we're going to come find you. Would you sign up for that class? Probably not. If you buy a mattress online now, the standard is a 100-night guarantee. You really need 100 nights to know if you like a mattress or not. Just ease in, right? Um, imagine if dating, if the bar were set this high, if you sat down at the dating table and the first conversation was, let's pick out our wedding invitation, what would you do? You'd probably call the police, right? You'd, or you'd leave, at least. Jesus doesn't even go on to lessen it here. He intensifies it. Look at verse 27. 
whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now for us, the cross is a symbol of victory, right? It's a symbol of conquering. For his audience right here, the cross was a symbol of conquering, but not a positive conquering. It was a reminder that they were under the thumb of Rome, And it would have conjured up images in their mind of people on the roadsides, on their way in between cities, who were literally hanging on a cross and dying. I mean, make no mistake, Jesus is saying, I want you to follow me in ultimate allegiance in all the relationships of your life, even to the point of death. His audience has to be asking the question that maybe some of you are asking this morning, Who in the world does this guy think he is to demand such allegiance? The reason that Jesus can demand such allegiance is because he is today, has always been, and will always be the center of the universe. And for you to orbit your life around anything else is incompatible with reality. How can he ask for so much? Look at what he says in Revelation 22. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Friends, he is the point of the universe. In John chapter 6, he says, I am the bread of life. He is the sustainer of the weariest soul. Colossians chapter 1, he said, it says of Jesus, all things were created through him and for him. He is the reason everything exists. You, whether you've realized this before this moment or not, you do not exist primarily for your job or your spouse or your children. All those are wonderful gifts that God may have given you or for your friends. You exist for Him. Listen to how Paul talks about this king in Philippians chapter 1. He says, My desire is to depart, that's to die, and be with Christ, for that is far better. See, Paul had the vision of Jesus that Jesus wants us to grasp of him today. Paul realized that Jesus was better than life. How could he he say this, that Jesus is better than life? Listen, because he is better than life. Not your feelings about him, not your thoughts about him, him. And if this morning, if you can't yet devote your, your whole self to him and his cause, then your heart hasn't yet caught a glimpse of who he actually is. And my prayer is that today you see him. You see, it is unlikely that many of us will literally have to die for our faith in Jesus. Now, some of us might, but his audience listening here, and many of them, were literally going to follow him to a cross. In fact, all of the disciples, the, the 12 apostles, would die a martyr's death with the exception of John, but that in no way means that John got off easy. Whether we will actually die or not, you need to know this. The cost of following Jesus is a cross for every disciple. Now, for most of us, our cross is going to be a different kind of cross. For some of you, it's going to be a social cross. You are going to be viewed as a bigot and as less intellectually sound because you openly confess Jesus as Lord. You're going to be thought of as less by your peers. For some of you, it will be an economic cross. It will be people not wanting to do business with you because of your convictions. It will be choosing a lower paying job strategically so that you have space and ability to care for and invest in other people. It will be a preference cost, living somewhere that you don't necessarily want to live for the sake of the gospel going forward. I'm going to go from preaching to meddling for just a second. Uh, 
I think we need to shift the way some of us talk about our own community here in Champaign-Urbana. Some of us go, oh, I can't wait to get out of here. Now, listen, if God is calling you somewhere else, I am not trying to guilt trip you right now, but I am saying to you, we got to open our eyes and embrace. If the most difficult things he asks us to do is to live in a place that doesn't have the stores that we like that much, that's a sm- those are small potatoes, guys. He's the king. He's given us everything. For some of you right now, the crosses that you're bearing for Christ feel particularly difficult. And I need to encourage you for a minute this morning. Do you know what crosses always lead to for Christians? Resurrections. Jesus was the first of many brothers. There is nothing that you will give up in Jesus' name that he will not repay in full and then some. What he says in Luke chapter 18, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brother or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to come. All that you give up in Jesus' name, he has promised to pay back with interest. So you know what that means? It means move with the church planting team. It means give sacrificially. It means go give a couple of years to international missions. It means position your life for the sake of the glory of God that you might be wrung out for the redemption of this generation and the next one. See, the cost of being a disciple is everything. And you got to ask the question honestly in your own heart, is he worth that to you? Jesus wants you to actually consider the answer to that question this morning. And in fact, he offers two little illustrations to kind of help us do that in the next section. And they're embedded with a question. There's a question in these. So that's point number two um, before we finish up today. The question of the invitation. Look at verse 28 in the text. It says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. Now, I want you to imagine, especially you graduates, let's pretend you kill it financially. Like you just do great, you make all kinds of money, you give $10 million to New City Church, and then on top of that, you've still got, I'm kidding, mostly. Um, (laughs) Well, let's pretend you hit it big and you're going to build a house. And you start interviewing contractors to build this new house that you want to build. And you sit down at your kitchen table and contractor walks in and sits down. And you say, okay, well, um, tell me about your experience. And they said, well, um, we started six years ago. We've had meteoric growth. We have started over 450 new home construction projects. And then they get quiet. What's your follow-up question? How many did you finish, right? Saying you started 450 construction projects is a lot different than saying we have completed over 450. You say, how many did you finish? Well, we finished about 40%, and then we had some financing issues, and then, um, but we have a lot of foundations, Bill. Are you going to hire that contractor? Of course not. Why? Because they don't have the foresight or the wisdom to know on the front end how much does it actually cost us to get this house off the ground. Only a fool would not count the cost on the front end of a difficult and challenging journey. Then Jesus immediately gives another story. In verse 31, he says, Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able to come, or whether, with, sorry, let me try again, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000. And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. Stop there for a moment. 
This last year, I read a book that felt like an obscure book for me, but I really enjoyed it. Um, it's a book called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Has anybody read that book? Really, I'm seeing a couple people around. It's very fascinating. It's like um, the philosophy of battle from an ancient Chinese general. So really, really fascinating to read. Um, kind of obscure, but pick it up. I think you might enjoy it. Maybe not. I don't know you that well. So... Um, but in the course of the book, one of the main things that he tries to drive home as a point is that a wise battle tactician only picks fights that they know they can win. If you're a strategic king or a commander of an army and you know that this army is going to annihilate you, you don't pick that fight. Or you somehow change the circumstances of the battlefield to weight the battle in your favor before you go in. You don't go in with mere wishful thinking and enthusiasm of, we can beat anybody. If you're 10,000 versus 20,000, you had better have some serious other advantages if you're going to be able to make it to the end. You see, if a commander, if a king knows that they're outgunned and outmanned, what do they do? They do everything they can to avoid that fight. That's what wisdom says, right? He sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. What is Jesus getting at with these two little stories right here? Really, both of these little stories or illustrations are getting at the same point, and they want you to ask a question. Here it is. Do you realize what this is going to cost you? Like if you've never asked that, if you've never said, oh man, it is a cost to say that Jesus is Lord because it means that I'm not. You're doing what a foolish builder or a foolish king would do. You're not counting and considering the actual cost of following Jesus. My friend, you cannot rightly start the journey with Jesus without counting the cost. At the end of the day, enthusiasm and idealism are not going to be enough to carry you to the end on this journey. What you're going to find is that it is the, the love and mercy of God that carries you along on this whole journey. So please don't hear what I'm not saying but you do have to count there's going to be a real cost to this thing. Now, you can't know the specifics. That's what some of you are probably asking. Will you tell me specifically what it's going to cost? I don't know if we could handle it. Like if on the front end, if he gave you a printout and he said, here are all the ways that you're going to suffer for my name, it's probably mercy that he doesn't give us that. Here's what we do have. It's going to be hard, and it's going to be good, and He's going to be with you. And all of those are true at once. Whatever you suffer, whatever crosses you bear, your Lord is not merely bearing His own cross in retrospect. He is bearing your cross with you. I want to bring those questions back up that we started our time with today. Have I really given up everything to my king? See, some of you this morning, you didn't think you would be coming to church, but you're actually at a crossroads moment in your life. This is a moment where maybe you need to transition from fan to follower. You need to evaluate the state of your own harm your own heart and confess Jesus as king. If you haven't yet really given up everything to him, today is a great day to surrender your life to the king. You're going to have a king. The question is, is your king perfect and does he really have your best interest at heart? Man, you don't even have your best interest at heart half the time. <laughs> as disappointing as that is, Have you really given up everything to follow your king? If you need help discerning that or processing that, I'm going to invite some of my friends. Um, if I uh, actually don't have anybody planned for this service, but if you're a member at New City and you're willing to just pray with people, will you go to the back during the second worship set um, to help people pray and process what's going on inside their hearts? 
The second question, am I being honest about the cost of following Jesus when I invite others to him? Listen, I want to take some pressure off of you and put some pressure on you. Here's the pressure I want to take off. You don't have to sell anybody anything when you share the gospel. Nothing. You just need to share the message and just get out of the way. Like, let the Holy Spirit do the work that he wants to do. But it also means that we got to actually invite people. Like, we've actually got to tell people that Jesus is worth the cost of following, right? And so I want to commission you into that work. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, whether you're an uh, an engineer or you are a systems person or you are an accountant or you are a janitor, whatever it is that God is calling you to do, you are meant to be a herald of the good news that Jesus is King who comes to make all things new. And the last question, is he worth it? Can I remind you this morning that a hard life with Jesus is better than an easy life without him? You, you get a king in Jesus that's asking you to give up everything who actually went first. That he didn't stand off and demand something of his followers, that he did not put on flesh and bones and bear up under himself. Jesus gave up his very life, left the praises and the renown of heaven, the song that's been going on since the beginning of time, and he stepped into a world filled with brokenness, sin, and shame. He took the suffering upon himself and he took the penalty of your sin and mine that we deserve to bear and he took it on himself for the glory of his Father's name. If you believe that, you're his and he is yours. Is he worth it? Yes. It's going to be hard. It's going to be good and he's going to be with you. Hey, we love you. If this is the last time some of you ever attend New City, I want you to know it's been an honor to open the Bible with you. I'm praying that God has used your time here to prepare you for what he has to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the cost can be really scary And some of us are feeling that more than others right now. I just pray that you'd minister to the hearts that are feeling that that tension, that angst right now. Holy Spirit, just do a good work in the room. I ask that you would um, bring people to that, that decision point, that watershed moment of giving everything to the King. And Holy Spirit, we are asking for you to stir in the life of our church, stir in the life of these graduates who are being launched out into the world. God, we love you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we don't just want you to hear the word around here. We want you to respond to the word. So the first way you can do that is simply by reflecting. How was God speaking to you? How was he pressing on you as you heard the word preached today? Well, talk to him about it. Talk to a friend that you're with about what's going on inside of you. Talk to somebody in the back of the room who's going to be there ready to pray with you. The second way that we respond is by remembering the Lord's death and taking the Lord's supper. If you are a follower of Jesus, we welcome you to the Lord's table today. This is the meal that Jesus gave us to remember that he went first, that his death and resurrection was enough for us. And so Christian, as you come to the table today, you're going to find some broken bread to represent his body and a cup to represent his shed blood. You're just going to take that bread and dip it in the juice. And as you take that, remember you serve a king who went first. Your redemption cost him, but he was glad to do it. 
He's given up everything for you. What can't you give up for him? And then finally, the way that we invite you to respond specifically today is by rehearsing. We like to call, when we sing and worship around here, this is a dress rehearsal for heaven. Singing praises to the king. In just a minute, this is a time for you to express your love and devotion to your king. If that means raising your hands and surrender, we welcome that. If that means kneeling in a posture of submission, we welcome that. If that means grabbing a friend and asking them to pray for the ministry of God's spirit on your life, we welcome that. Respond however the spirit is leading you in that way. So, New City, I love you. I love being your pastor. Respond when you're ready.